We have a confession. We both find it really hard to focus on anything for an extended period of time. We experience this in our work, in our projects like this YouTube channel, and even in our relationships. And this is something that we've actually witnessed get worse over time. We both used to be the kind of kids who would sit outside all day reading a book, you know, wouldn't even notice that it had gotten dark. And now we really struggle to concentrate on anything if it's going to take us longer than 20 minutes. Now, this is clearly not unique to us. And Johan Hari's brilliant book, Stolen Focus, brilliant book, Stolen Focus, has helped us understand why this is happening and what we can do about it. As individuals, it can be really easy to feel like we're personally responsible. Mm. It can feel like our failing of attention is a failing of commitment or an inability to follow through with the things that we've said we're gonna do or some inability to stay off social media. But it turns out that the reasons that we are struggling to concentrate are far bigger than any single individual. There are bigger factors at play that are continuously and systematically degrading our ability to pay attention. And if we really want to address this problem, we're going to have to look at this in a whole new way. This book totally changed how we look at this issue. So the author, Johan Hari, has traveled the world to meet and interview the leading scientists and researchers on this issue. There are four key points that we're going to talk through and summarize today. These are... Number one, there isn't just a single type of attention. There's actually three different types and each one serves a different purpose and we need to understand all three in order to address the issue. The second is that the crisis of attention that we're seeing as a society is not actually a problem on the individual level and blaming ourselves for it does a lot more harm than good. The third is to reverse this trend and reclaim our collective attention. We need to go beyond the individual and reevaluate our social, economic and political systems. And number four is that regardless of that, there are some things we can do as individuals to help reclaim some of that focus. As per normal, chapters are provided in the video, so if you only want to listen to a particular part of this, you can choose your own adventure. Let's dive in. So let's get started with the different types of attention. Johan Hari's research has shown that there are actually three separate types of attention. He calls them spotlight, daylight, and starlight. Spotlight attention is when we have our attention focused on a single narrow thing. So this is like reading a book, for example. Daylight attention is broad and unspecific. This is what happens when you let your mind wander from thing to thing. Now, this might seem on the surface to be a little bit redundant or unnecessary, but it's super, super critical because it gives our brains times to form new connections and to process emotional events and new thoughts and new ideas as they come up. This is one of the single most important drivers of both emotional regulation and creativity. Starlight attention is the ability to focus on kind of broader, bigger things that are outside of just here and now. So this is what keeps us focused on kind of our long-term goals and the things that are important to us in a much broader sense. In the modern world, we're far too reliant on the spotlight kind of attention to the point of overuse, and we actually lose any chance to engage with the daylight and starlight types of attention. So the combination of our increasingly hectic work schedules and the constant stream of entertainment that's always at our fingertips means that our minds never actually have free time to just wander. I mean, I'm definitely guilty of this in any of those like free moments that I have like if I'm on the bus to work or doing the dishes we always cram something in like we're always listening to a podcast watching Netflix listening to music whatever it is we never give our minds that time to just go and touch on whatever they want to touch on this means that our brains never have time to actually filter through and process all of the information that we're taking in every single day. So we never have time to form connections that were previously there between unrelated things or reflect on what is important to us and what really motivates us. So one of the key takeaways from this book is that it's really, really important to carve out time for our daylight and starlight attention to flourish too. Takeaway number two is that our crisis of attention is not a personal failing. Now, we fundamentally have caveman brains and in a caveman world, there wasn't this constant fluctuation of things that we need to be paying attention to in the same way that we have today. Now, Johan Hari specifically writes about 12 different things that are degrading our attention and inhibiting our ability to focus. Um, we'll put them up on the screen here so you can have a proper look at them. But to simplify it down, we think this can be thought about broadly in terms of two patterns. Firstly, there is more for us to focus on. And secondly, it is harder for us to focus. So change number one that has happened is that there are way more things to focus on than ever before. Busyness is the new norm. People are expected to always be going and our structures, our economic and social structures are really built on this idea. Never before have we had so much to do all the time. 
at the same time, technology means that we have this constant flow of information and entertainment right at our fingertips. Technology gives us a constant stream of things that we can and feel like we must focus on. Think about the 24 hour news cycle, for example. Today, there are all these super urgent things grabbing at our attentions and tomorrow, those things are gonna disappear entirely and be replaced by a whole new batch of things that we need to think about. Statistically, we're taking in more information every day than at any point in human history and by a long, long shot. And finally, the abundance of technology and the entertainment that it facilitates means that we are constantly context switching. We pay attention to a single thing for an average of about three minutes now, which is just insane. So not only is our culture expecting us to focus on far more things than ever before, there are also systematic things occurring to make it way harder to focus on any one thing at any particular time. So firstly, our sleep quality is reducing. There's nowhere near enough people sleeping the recommended seven to eight hours a night and not sleeping enough has a drastic, drastic influence over our ability to focus on the task at hand. Secondly, our diets in the modern world are moving away from nutritious whole foods towards hyper-processed foods that also have a massive, massive impact on our ability to pay attention. He also talks about the effects of rising pollution. So pollution is a massive one. It causes these neurological changes in the brain that again, make it way harder to pay attention. They actually cause similar patterns in the brain to what dementia causes. And finally, our engagement with other long form types of media and education are drastically different to what they used to be. Firstly, as a society, we don't read long form content that much anymore. And it's been proven that long form content, like sitting down and reading a book, deepens the focus and the ability to pay attention to a particular task. Our education systems have also moved away from this type of learning that really nurtures creativity and develops curiosity in young people that enables them to focus on things later on in their life and towards optimizing for very narrow and specific standardized tests. So these two trends combined are a brutal combination and our brains are just not designed to deal with this. Despite this fact, Hari talks about what he calls the rise of cruel optimism, which is essentially this very pervasive belief in our society that individual changes are actually enough to amount to fixing a structural problem. The example that he uses is if somebody told you that the solution to the pollution crisis was for you personally to wear a gas mask every time you left the house. Now that's not necessarily wrong, it probably would help, it would help you at an individual level, but if you're expecting that to solve the problem, you're bound to be disappointed because it's a very, very temporary fix and it's not actually addressing the structural underlying problem. This leads us neatly into insight number three, which is that the fix for this lies in our systems, not with the individual. We need to turn to our wider social and economic systems that are creating the incentive structures that lead to this degradation of focus. And we need to dismantle those things so that we aren't in this battle between those structures and the focus that we're trying to find as an individual. So Hari talks about things like social media companies. Now these companies hold an immense amount of power over our attentions. Because of the economic and the social structure that we live in, they're incentivized to keep you on their platforms so that they can turn your attention into more and more profit. Until we address those underlying structural factors, there's never gonna be the incentive structure that we need for these companies to actually reverse that and help support our attention instead. If we could incentivize these companies to prioritize the human interests of their users and support that focus and attention, we would be in a far better place where these powerful institutions were actually capable of supporting our attention rather than degrading it. It's exactly the same with the food industry and the problem of pollution. There are profound incentives for companies to keep costs as low as possible and little to no incentives to increase the nutritional value of food, for example, or reduce pollution. We need to actually change what these industries are optimizing for. So we can do that by voting with our dollar or protesting as individuals, but what we really need is to enact legislation. This is one of the most immediate ways to actually change what these companies are optimizing for and get them to consider the greater good of society with the products that they're making. Our fourth key takeaway from this book is that even though this is a large societal structural problem, there are things that we can do as individuals to help reclaim some of our focus. So one of the great things about this book is that the author himself actually steps through some of the things that he does to help manage his own focus and claim back some of that focus time. And that's been really helpful for us to be inspired by those things and implement them in our own lives. Here are some of the things that he does. Thing number one is that he ensures that he goes for a one hour walk 
every day without his phone. This gives him the space to nurture that daylight and starlight, that more diffuse attention. And it also helps his brain get more comfortable with being away from social media and away from this constant stream of attention and things that give you those little dopamine hits. So our version of this is we have really set times where we are away from our phones and away from social media. For example, on the way to work, on the bus in the morning, I make sure not to use my phone and not to listen to anything because I know in that half hour block, that's some more time for my brain to do those things. Or doing the dishes or hanging out the laundry, just those little moments where it's so easy to put on music or listen to a exactly. podcast. I feel like particularly there's this pressure to be productive and like, mm. oh, I've got to listen to a podcast. That's right. But actually your mind's going to be better off. It's going to be more healthy, more happy, yeah. more creative if you give it time to just wander. The second thing he does is that when he knows there's going to be a task that he really wants to focus on, he uses pre-commitments to help him stay focused on the task at hand. He does this by using an app called Freedom, which we've actually talked about at length on this channel. We love it. We use it all the time. But he basically uses this to block websites or social media or news sites when he knows he's going to be on his computer trying to focus on a particular task like writing an article or something of that nature. So that means that even if you're tempted to go on distracting websites, you physically cannot access them in that moment. It's a really good hack. The second thing he does is he actually locks his phone in a thing called a K-safe. So it's a thing where you put your phone in this glass box and there's like a lock on it and you set a timer for how long you want it to be locked away for and you physically cannot take your phone out of that box for that amount of time. This is not something that we do, we don't have a case safe, uh, but it's an interesting way to think about really removing your physical dependence on that phone and your ability to actually access it if you're trying to focus on something that you really don't want to be on your phone for. It's easy to go on Instagram when it's kind of a swipe up and you tap, mm. but if you need to smash a safe open to do it, <laughs> probably a little bit less likely to, to get distracted by that. Yeah, and the safe is probably expensive. <laughs> so you probably yeah, want to that's do that. right. The third thing he does is be really intentional about creating flow states. Now, flow states are those wonderful times when you are totally absorbed in a task. And instead of asking himself, why can't I focus on this thing? He asks himself, what could I do to get myself into one of these states where I'm just entirely absorbed and there's nothing else on my mind? We try and do this in a few ways, but I'd say the biggest one is really time blocking and making sure there's times where we're not going to have meetings or we're not going to be disturbed by people so that we know we have the time and the attention to really go deep on whatever it is that we're working on. Mm. The other research that's really important about flow states is that they come when a task is just the right amount of meaningful and difficult. So it needs to be something that we really care about and it needs to be hard enough to push us, mm -hmm. but not so hard that we feel like we can't do it. So structuring how we do these tasks and how we define these tasks in such a way that it meets those two criteria is a really effective way to induce states of flow. The fourth thing that he talks about doing is a pretty obvious one, but it's basically maintaining a good diet, good exercise, sleeping enough and practicing habits like mindfulness and yoga. That doesn't mean you have to do yoga or meditation every single day, but it's just the fact that having a healthy body will mean that your mind is healthier and it's more likely to be able to focus on the things that are important to you. Totally. And the fifth thing, which kind of relates to that quite nicely, is he doesn't beat himself up about it. So we're humans, we're kind of inherently imperfect. <laughs> We've talked about it at length now, but there are really structural reasons that these things are very, very difficult to do. Mm. So we're always going to screw up. We do it all the time. And when that does happen, he's really specific about saying to himself, hey, this isn't me being a failure or, you know, me not caring enough or, a, you know, failing of my character. It's just, I'm doing my best and that is enough. But those are the four big takeaways that we had from this book. And we really, really loved reading it, as scary as some of the things that he talks about in it are. Something that this book really left us feeling was the urgency of this situation. Mm. It's something that is kind of a multiplier on our abilities to accomplish anything as individuals and as a society. Mm. And as such, addressing these structural societal challenges that we have that are inhibiting our ability to pay attention is something that we all need to be thinking about and we all need to be thinking about it right now. One example that he brings up is that of climate change and he basically asks how as a society are we meant to solve this cripplingly important problem of climate change if we can't even sit down and focus on a task? So for us this acted as a little bit of a call to action mm. and it forced us to ask ourselves you know, do we want to be looking back 20 years from now at the horrors that our inability to really focus on the things that matter have caused, both at a personal level and at a societal level? Or do we want to start making the changes that we need to make right now in order to reverse this trend? 
And this could be one of the most important challenges that we face in our lifetimes. On a lighter note, it's really interesting and really empowering to, to think about these things and how we can apply them to our own lives. So we really do mean it when we say that we enjoyed reading this book. All right, that's the end of the video. We really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found something useful in our key takeaways. Let us know if you've read it or if you intend to read it. Um, and if there's any other books like this that you'd like us to kind of summarize and review, let us know in the comments down below. We'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.